Uh, first Journalism Directors Forum of the new semester. It's a great pleasure today to present two really fun guests, longtime friends of mine and of many of you in the room, um, Allison and Margaret Engel, who are twin sisters who have done it all in journalism. <laughs> and we're here to tell us uh, about their play uh, on Molly Ivins, which is called Red Hot Patriot, the kick-ass wit of Molly Ivins, <laughs> which is showing now at the Geffen Playhouse. It's still in previews. Is tonight the dress for Yes, yeah, right. And tomorrow's opening. Okay, tomorrow's big opening. And um, these two really literally have done it all. And I think for the students in the room to be able to think about their careers unfolding, I mean, more traditional journalism. Peggy, to my immediate left, has worked for the Illinois Register, the Washington <coughs> Post, then branched out, was managing editor of the museum, um, still runs the Alicia Patterson Fellowship. Uh, many other things, chaired, has chaired Duchel, the Robert F. Kennedy Awards, et cetera, et cetera, and you could say more. Allison, our twin, Peggy lives in Bethesda and works in DC. Allison is our twin, who works here in LA. And uh, also, Legacy Media, San Jose Martin News, and others, was director of communications for USC until recently. She switched over to the very interesting job uh, heading the Los Angeles Institute of Humanities. Gets to meet all kinds of interesting people. I'm sure I'm going to the first one you're running then. I wish that sounds great. Thank you, Lord. Um, got a script, master's in screenwriting right here, which is really cool. But I mean, really, as the New York Times piece about uh, Red Hot Patriot, when it, it opened in Philadelphia, said, these two have, you know, obviously done a lot together. We've written three books, I think. America's Most Interesting Local Foods, uh, baseball stadiums, you know. <laughs> but, 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 as the Times said, they haven't been playwrights. <laughs> they did this fabulous play, uh, which has been in Philly and Austin, and now it's come to LA. They're working on other plays. As you can tell, I'm an enormous fan. I will turn it over to the twin sisters who are bringing us the kick ass win from <laughs> A lot of people ask us why we did a play on Molly Ivins. And I think that the genesis of it was when Molly died in 2009, Peggy called me the day she died and said, we should do a play about Molly Ivins. And what we were thinking about at the time was Mark Twain Tonight with Hal Holbrook. And Hal Holbrook has done this for 40 years. And basically, if you've seen it, it's wonderful. He has about four hours of material memorized on Mark Twain, and he stands in front of a curtain and does an hour and a half of it each night. And so we thought, well, we can do that. We can just edit Molly's things, pick out the best things, and you know. That, so it didn't seem to us like an insurmountable challenge. However, as soon as we started talking to theater people about it, everyone said, well, Mark Twain is a one-off. You can't do that anymore. It worked for Hal Holbrook, but you really need to write a play about Molly. And so that's when we started in on um, realizing that our carefully edited collection of her quips and anecdotes was not going to be sufficient. So I'll tell you for those who don't know who Molly was. She was a journalist who I had met about three times, but just briefly and as a fan. She was a columnist most notably in about 410 papers at her height. But she also had an earlier career as a reporter at the New York Times and even had a gig on 60 Minutes for about six months um, as a correspondent. But she really didn't fit the mold of a conventional journalist and her politics often collided with the mainstream media. And she found the best place for her voice was her hometown in Austin, Texas. So that's where she was a syndicated columnist after having worked for about six newspapers, Minneapolis Star Tribune. She worked for the Dallas Times Herald. She worked for the Texas Observer, which was uh, and is a magazine where she really probably came to her greatest uh, attention because she had a free reign to write what she wanted. And she's um, a political writer, but extremely funny. And that combination of being able to take complicated issues and infuse it with humor is what really got uh, Molly, I think, on the map. 
And one thing that I think it's important to know about her is that you know, politics lately is all about the, the quip and the put down and the so forth. And Molly could do that with the best of them. But what she had to back it up was a lot of really serious research and reporting. She did a lot of reporting on the financial crisis. Being in Texas, she saw the, the savings and loan debacle and then the, the bank failures after that. And so she was not just one who could get off a great line about Newt Gingrich that everybody would laugh about and, and pass around. She really was a very serious journalist. And I think that the really one of the more remarkable things is that the influence that she was able to have being out of the corridor of powers of you know, Washington and New York, where it's just assumed that that's where all serious journalists reside. And she was really able to have an influence being out in the provinces. And I think that that um, probably helped her reporting because she, she wasn't part of the herd mentality. And we thought it made, there's so many wonderful journalists all over this country. They're not all concentrated in Washington and New York. And that was another reason why her story really resonated with us, because she could have stayed in New York, even though she could get fired from the Times. But she could have stayed in New York or Washington. Um, but she chose to go to Austin and to, to kind of be the, the pundit from the hinterlands. So when we started this whole playwriting process, it just instantly occurred to us that it should be a play, that it was her voice that people are going to and do miss the most. And also because um, I had been at this um, conference in upstate New York, uh, a, a women's conference, and two of the participants there were Jane Fonda and Sally Fields. And they had made a sort of impassioned plea to the audience of about 400 women um, and they said, you know, we are, we have aged out of our profession, of our entertainment profession. Nobody writes for us anymore. All we get are the grandmother roles. And so they just said, would you please write for women over 50? And so that was sort of in the back of my mind and Allison's mind when we did this, that uh, there are spectacular actresses all across this country who might really welcome the vehicle of this amazing woman to bring to the stage. And so that, indeed, is what has happened. Because not only have we had those productions that Geneva mentioned, but there have been uh, Samuel French and Company published the play. And so that uh, makes it available for license. And it's been uh, produced in about eight other smaller venues. Because every <coughs> city of some size has a group of spectacular women artists who, who want to do this. So it's been you know, Bloomington, Indiana, and Syracuse, New York. And uh, it's going to be in Fort Worth and Houston. And there are about five others I'm forgetting right now, but uh, Rehoboth, Delaware. And I'm, I'm happiest about that, and I think Molly would have been happy about that, that her, her voice, particularly in this political year, um, is somewhat alive, still on stage. We have Google alerts about Molly Ivins. So we see, it, it just yesterday, someone, um, and I wish I could remember the site, but people were supposed to write in their favorite Molly Ivins quote. And there were just you know, dozens and dozens. And people, almost every day, there's a Google alert, someone writing somewhere, oh, I really wish uh, Molly was still alive. I wonder what she'd say about this. I wonder. And so there is, there really is um, this legacy. And of course, it's like we're focused on it. So you know, we pick them all up. But um, if people want to know how the actual production came about, was that, and I think that this is good for students to know, is that when we had this idea, we went ahead and wrote it. We did not have permission. We had not contacted the family when we started out. We knew we were going to have to, but we, we thought we, we wanted to have something to show them rather than just, oh, we'd like to do this because we had no journalistic back or no theatrical background and they would have said no. So we finished it. And then I was talking to a friend of mine from Iowa. And um, I always say all good things in my life have come because I lived in Iowa. I got this job at USC because of an Iowa, and here, here's another one. This is not true for everybody. Yeah, I mean, Iowa is just the, 
the golden ticket. Um, <laughs> so um, I told him that we were working on this this play, and, and he said, "Oh, what are two Yankee girls doing writing about uh, this this Texan?" And he said, "Well, who do you want to play Molly?" And he said, "Kathleen Turner would be great." And he said, "Well, you know, I sit on a board with her." <laughs> and I didn't know that she has been, and he has been, on the board of People for the American Way, which is Norman Lear's progressive organization, for decades together. And he said, oh, I'm going to tell her about this. And I said, well, Jim, you can't do that because we don't have permission yet. Um, we were going to get it, but don't say anything to her because, until we get permission. And then I said to Peggy, we need to start on this. Well, of course, they were meeting next week, and he tells her. And she says... I want that script because it turned out that Kathleen lives in New York and for a while um, Ann Richards who was the former governor of Texas who was very close to Molly lived in New York for a while and they lived in the same apartment building <laughs> so when Molly would come to New York to visit Ann Richards they would often invite Kathleen up for you know a drink oh, or so oh, she oh, had oh, met Molly oh, several times oh, wow. so anyway she really wanted to do the script and so then Peggy and I got very serious about trying to find out who had the rights. We thought it must be her family. And we weren't getting anywhere contacting the family. And we had talked to friends of hers. I'll let you take it. Uh, I had gotten invited. Uh, one of my former Alicia Patterson fellows uh, grew up in Boulder, Colorado. And his parents are very active in something called the Conference on World Affairs, which has been going on for 68 years. And Eleanor Roosevelt and Henry Wallace started it. And it's a confab where the people take over the city of Boulder and bring in folks from around the world and talk about pressing issues. So this former fellow of mine got me invited to be one of the 100 speakers. So a, a coincidence, which has played just a, such a great role in this whole playwriting process, uh, Molly's co-author, Lou DeBose, was also one of the speakers. So I got to know him well, and I asked him about this, and he put us in touch with their agent who held and does hold all of Molly's literary rights, which accrue to the Texas Observer and the ACLU. Wow. So we went, we, Allison came to Washington and we flew to New York. And on our own dime. On our own dime, just crossed the threshold of this agent's um, tiny office and we asked him if we could write a play about Molly. And unbeknownst to us, two established, two separate established playwrights had already made that journey, had gotten the approval, and they had fallen out of favor with the agent of creative differences. We still don't know who they were. We don't know what happened. But he said, okay, I'll give you Wait, six months. Yeah, he gave us that. Well, first he said, well, you two have no theatrical credibility. <laughs> 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 he wasn't very welcoming. Let's put that way. But you do have the journalistic, uh, you know, background. So he said, I'll give you six months to get a production up and running. And we found out later that that is like saying six minutes. Because usually they give people several years at the minimum. I mean, most plays take five years. So giving us six months was so ludicrous, but we didn't know that. Yeah. So we went back and Allison showed the script to Kathleen Turner, but before Kathleen had seen it, um, I showed it to uh, Molly Smith at Arena Stage uh, in, in Washington, in Washington D.C. because um, her treasurer of the Arena Board, son, used to work for me at the museum. And he said, hey, you wrote a play. My dad's interested in plays. Why don't you send it to him? So I did. He gave it to Molly Smith. She read it, and she said, I want to do this play. So, And then we said, well, we think we have Kathleen Turner. And she said, well, I really want to do this play. <laughs> so uh, we did a stage reading in Washington. And it went well, but then Kathleen's schedule got all complicated, and it couldn't fit the opening at Arena Stage. So we had Kathleen, and we had the play, but we didn't have a theater. And so Kathleen's agent called around and got Philadelphia Theater Company interested, and so that's why we did the premiere there. And it was really kind of a, uh, I think, a good test because although Molly Ivins had relationships with lots of cities, you know, all almost all the cities in Texas and Boulder, Colorado, and uh, New York or Washington D.C., she really didn't have any particular, uh, you know, relationship with Philadelphia. So we thought if it would do well there, <laughs> um, it would, it would, it would, it would you know, do well anywhere. And. So we made the six-month deadline. Everyone's shocked and surprised. It actually only took us four months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, 
And uh, it turned out, and they gave us things we don't know as, a, as rookies at this. Um, as the playwright, you get to choose the director and the set designer and the customer, like we knew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Philadelphia Theater Company gave us a list of 10 directors. I, you know, it was like Greek and never heard of anybody. Um, but I have one friend in the theater community, and he, his mother worked for my husband's political campaigns. And he's a director in Broadway, on Broadway. So I called up Michael and I said, I'm just going to read you this list. And he was great, you know, so opinionated. You read them all. It's terrible. No, I can't do it. And so we got to David S. B. Ornson. He said, oh, he's terrific. So that's how that happened. And we called David. And then David really picked the set designer and the costumer because he's worked in the theater forever and he knows all these people. So um, that was the single best stroke of genius. Um, that next happened to this production because he is spectacular. He's just finished Driving Miss Daisy on Broadway and mm -hmm. in London with James Earl Jones and Vanessa Redgrave. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was out here at the Geffen uh, last season with Equivocation, its premiere. But he helped us shape the play so much in Philadelphia. And it, because, let me because normally you have several staged readings and you have like maybe for a two week stage reading with uh, invited audiences and then you wait a few months and do some things and then you do it. I mean, this goes on for years for most plays. We went from that one night at Arena Stage where Kathleen basically read the, the script to being in the rehearsal room in New York City because Kathleen lives in New York and so does David, so that's where the rehearsal was, knowing that we, were, we had a date <coughs> in Philadelphia. So that is like, unheard of because we were trying to shape the play at the same time Kathleen's trying to learn it and um, so it was very very compressed and it was really nerve-wracking and um, when we then went to Philadelphia we were still making <coughs> changes and I mean we're still making changes now but not as many I mean we made 26 changes to this production but it's all just like a word or a line very small but in Philadelphia the night before we had our first <coughs> premiere we cut 10 minutes from it oh, and wow. Kathleen had already you know memorized it all so she had like five hours to essentially relearn it and we weren't it wasn't 10 minutes all at one spot it was, oh. you know, oh. it was here, it was here. <laughs> so that's when we really I mean, we always knew that Kathleen was unbelievable talent but to see her do that and I mean she was she was under the gun but she really without complaint did it and and hit it out of the ball but probably one of the best performances I've ever seen her do in all these performances was that night with all those changes so um, it turned out to end up breaking Philadelphia Theater Company's 35 year history of box office records oh. so it was a, it was a big hit we brought everybody from Iowa exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was the other thing there were plane loads of Texans who came and that was <laughs> That was really, you know, I mean, they really, really, I mean, it's their Molly, and they feel, and I think that if anyone is writing about a person who is either alive or recently alive, that was something that we, we were very aware of, that Molly has lots of friends, and they all say they're her best friend, and so you really <coughs> have to honor that, and we spent an awful lot of time calling people, meeting with them, having coffee. When we went to Austin, we didn't want to be seen as these carpetbaggers who flew in and were taking their molly away from them, so we spent a lot of time talking to people, and I think that it did pay off, And but that was also nerve-wracking when they all flew up to Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and like Lou DeVos, he was her co-author in the book she wrote, not her columns, but we were so nervous about what he got. And also Molly's sister and brother, her mm. two remaining siblings, uh, her siblings came, and they also really liked it and felt it did her honor and justice, so that was good. Because it's not, it's not a candy-coated um, Hall of Fame presentation. I mean, it, it's sort of warts and all, so your siblings might not like everything that's in it. Mm -hmm. did. So I think that's something to, to think about, though, is that um, it, everyone has his or her opinion about something. And like any journalist, the, the most important thing you can do is evaluate your sources. So you had to listen to several different points of view on Molly and kind of uh, 
decide what, what was the truth of, of the man. You mean while you were writing it or after making changes? Uh, while, while we were writing, writing it, you yeah. know, we called a lot of friends and just did long phone interviews with them. Not so much to include every last encyclopedic bit about this woman in a play, but to really get a fuller picture so that when we understandably had to pick a really narrow focus because the play just covers really one one moment in her life, um, that it would be true to all the experiences that came before. There was a lot of stuff we had to leave out. You know, the enti her entire, all her financial reporting and um, she did, she covered a lot of topics that you, you just can't, somebody who's been in the business for 40 years, you can't cover all facets of their life. Um, the 60 minutes thing we just talked about very, very briefly. Um, and you, you just have to make those choices because even if you were doing a long magazine article, you might put more of those things in. But you have to think about you know, theatricality and what really what really plays. And it can't be necessarily comprehensive. You can give hints of things, but the only complaint we've gotten about the show is that about three or four people have said it's too short. They wanted more, and they like. And we said, David, we've got all this material. We can put it back in. And he goes, No, if that's what you want. You want everyone thinking that they wish they could have more, yeah. instead of you know looking at their watch and wondering about their parking meters. <laughs> all right. So uh, you guys should feel free to just yeah. go. Okay. Yeah. Talk about yourself. <laughs> Got both have journalism careers, yeah. both highly accomplished. You're going to team together on a project. I guess neither of you has seniority as a playwright. <laughs> You've got to work this thing out. How do, you, how do you bounce ideas off each other? Do you already know what the other one's going to think? Because two twins. Yeah. You know, so, so, well, so you're, you know, yeah. there's awards and all kind of things on Molly. It does make it great for short telephone conversations because. We don't have to go through this whole preamble like, oh, well, you know, I can see your point. That's not working. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we don't have to be particularly nice to each other on those, on those scores. Because um, we have Yeah, it's faster. And um, we earlier had um, collaborated on these the series of three books for HarperCollins on America's best local foods and the people who produce them. And that was more journalistic, where we went around the country. And, and that was back in the days when we started out with carbon paper. And, and so we would actually split up the writing and the reporting. And it would be a waste of time for two of us to go to the same place. And so we would just do it and then switch. You know, we literally send it by mail. And usually, it. it for us, I know that in, in Hollywood particularly, a lot of people have writing partners and one person will be at the keyboard and the other person will be pacing and they do things like that. That would not work for us. We each write some things and then send it to the other. And um, I, I think you get twice as many ideas that way because if you're in the same room trying to do it, you're, you're both going down the same path. And um, so it has worked better for us to each take a crack at a scene, for example, then send it to each other and, and maybe mm -hmm. be pleasantly surprised if somebody else thought of something completely different than you would have thought. I was just wondering, do you have uh, available some of Molly's favorite quotes of your favorite Molly Ivins? <laughs> One of them was she said was that she was talking about humor, and I just love this. She said, you know, that humor is very important because when you get people to laugh, they open up their ears and, and hear and listen. And I think that that is true, and you see that from um, all numbers of writers, that, that humor can be a very, very effective way to get people to really listen and think. So but not the sharp political. Well, she she was the one who gave George Bush the name Shrub. Right. Yeah. And, and George Bush Jr. And so she she used to, she said about him he uh, when everyone was talking about the fact that he could speak Spanish she said he is not bilingual he is bi ignorant. Uh, there is another one. Um, if his IQ got any lower, they'd have to water him. <laughs> 
I was wondering if I, I'm going to come see the play. It's really nice to meet you. I've heard wonderful things about your play from uh, the production in Austin in particular. I was, but I was wondering if you could give me a little preview, not a whole preview play, but I just want to know, is shit in the play? Yes. yes. Oh, good. <laughs> that was her dog. Um, yeah. in, the Texas, in the Texas Observer, she had an office dog, and she named that dog because she wanted to be able to go out back and yell at the dog, yell shit whenever she felt like it. <laughs> so that's definitely in the play. Yes. <laughs> yeah. but she, I mean, she was a larger than life character, mm -hmm. and some of it was the Molly show put on, but she really did live that life. She drove a truck. Six feet tall, red hair, freckles, cowboy boots. She, she was not uh, somebody you would overlook if, you, <laughs> if she came into this room. Yeah, but when I was with ABC News, they wanted me to do a story on the Bubba Factor because my boss is in New York and never heard this term. Um, <coughs> and Clinton was running, so I called Molly, and she interviewed her, and she said, "Well, you know, you're Bubba. If when your porch collapses, at least six dogs die." <laughs> It's interesting. She went to Smith. She went to Smith College, and she was fluent in French. She actually spoke three languages. But when she was in Texas, and also you could hear her when we we did go and look at her um, video performances uh, when she was being interviewed, and she was on some talk shows and on 60 Minutes. Her Texas accent would get, yeah. you know, more, more pronounced when she was um, telling these stories. But she could sound very uh, non-Texan as well. So it was something that kind of came and went as at, at will. She was also a gourmet cook. Loved to spend oh. long hours searching for obscure recipes. And a woman named Ellen Sweets, who was uh, who is a writer in in Texas, um, just came out with a cook that she did really. Uh, stirring, stirring, it stirring it up with Molly because they would just spend all these all-day cook-a-thons. Ah. So that was a part of her life too. Ah. Yes. Did you have to fictionalize any dialogue? Or? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> so how did you talk about that process? Well, when we started off, it was probably about 80% of Molly's words and about 20% of ours. But now, I, it used to be about 50-50. Now I think it might be 60% ours and 40% Molly's, just because of how the strictures of the play require it. But um, so many people, even people who knew her, have quoted lines in our play and said, I remember when Molly said that. <laughs> Molly in there, there were. Um, Peggy got one line off a t-shirt she saw somewhere. I'm not going to say them all because then you won't, you'll, you'll know all the laugh lines, but it sounds like something Molly would have said and if we needed something. <coughs> um, and even though there was tons of material from her, there, you, as I said earlier, the, the, you just can't take an whole anecdotes and put them one after another and have it, have it move. There has to be a transition and so forth. And this narrative arc and the forward motion, those were the sort of the two controlling angels on our shoulders that required us. But how did you know that when you started to write the play? I mean, well, how well, did you know we didn't really actually yeah. as much, but you know, uh, we started talking to people who had written a lot of plays. I, I met this woman named Gretchen Kreider who <laughs> does uh, playwriting analysis and she had been a playwright herself. She helped. Um, there were uh, a former Washington Post theater critic helped. Uh, we just went to a lot of people we knew in the business and said, you know, please read this, please help us. Yeah, yeah if, if, it, if originally when you started the play, the dialogue was 80% Molly and 20% you, and so you were assembling these puzzle pieces to make the original thing. If you were now starting a new play about a living or recently dead person, knowing that you've moved from 80, 20 to like 40, 60, well, how would that change your process of starting a new play? Well, actually, we have already done that. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're working on a play on Irma Bombeck, who oh. was, um, <laughs> Irma was syndicated in 900 newspapers. And I think that there will never be anyone no. there before or since. First of all, there aren't, there aren't 900 newspapers. She was an extraordinary 
influence on America and really lived that time from when women were at home with the children to then. She ended up uh, spending a year going around the country stumping for the Equal Rights Amendment. Wow. And I, we feel that if she had been able, if they had recruited her a little bit sooner, it may have passed <laughs> because <laughs> she was exactly the sort of person. But anyway, when we did, when we started that, <coughs> we started thinking from the very beginning that we were going to have to put in more transis transitions and do more of the writing. Which we have, and so we're using uh, less of her work, actually, because it is also she didn't engage too much in one-liners, but um, <coughs> and it's a little dated, yeah, some of the funny heroes. scenarios. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. More scenarios. Cool, too. And then we're, we should yeah, talk about well, the other, and then the other, the other project that we're working on, and we've done, I think, two drafts, is um, we were contacted by uh, a company that has all the rights to Damon Runyon's work. And Damon Runyon is, is, most people know him as the guy who wrote the short story that Guys and Dolls was written, uh, was taken from. But he was the most prolific journalist. He was like Woody Allen Zellick. He was everywhere. The San Francisco <coughs> earthquake, he was there. Lindbergh, baby cat, kidnapping, he covered that. Pancho Villa. Yeah, uh, the uh, J.P. Uh, Morgan trial. I mean, it was, it <laughs> discovered Shirley Temple. I mean, <laughs> this, this guy really lived about 12 lives. And so, although a lot of his play, a lot of his short stories have been made into movies and um, plays, there's never been something about him other than a, uh, some biographies. Jimmy Breslin did a really well-known biography. So, the problem there is the guy has done so much that it is really, you know, just constantly having to, oh, we can't put in, you know, this amazing, experience he had in all the people that he knew, but he really did create the whole idea of Broadway as this uh, noir, all the Broadway characters and gangsters and um, gamblers, and so we're, we're pretty far along in that yeah, one. Yeah. We're, we're, so we're specializing in writers. <laughs> and letting the world know about writers. Because <laughs> also you're starting with their good material, so it, it helps, helps you out. <laughs> I, I just wanted to share a little story about, I mean, I didn't really know Molly Ivins, but I wanted to, to share a little story about how kind she could be, um, because she's known, obviously, as, you know, all the things that you said, and, and we all know that incredibly witty, strong part of her. <coughs> when I was starting my career, it was as a freelancer in Arizona, and I came across very complicated story about in the aftermath of the car bombing murder of reporter Don Bowles, there was some talk among people I was uh, regularly interviewing that there was connections to coal on the Navajo Reservation and some of the highest people in, in, in power in Arizona. And somebody had told me that, that Molly had started to look at this. Um, and I didn't know where I was, like 25 years old, I was just out of college. And um, I had mentioned this to someone at NPR, which I was starting to work on. He's like, you know, you're in no position to do this. I mean, you're way over your head. And I was. Um, but I just kept you know, looking at it, and I called her. And she was so kind to me. And she, was, and she took me seriously as a colleague, and I was like, I was just so green, you know. And she, she just talked me through it. She shared what she knew. She said, I think this is, you know, this is kind of a dangerous story. You have to be careful. But I always remember like like moments like that when you're first starting out, especially like you know she at the time I didn't know she was Molly Ivan. She was the Denver bureau chief for the New York Times, um, which some people don't remember. I told a friend of mine she was, you know, and that's before she became the Bob Molly Ivan. She was and apparently she was quite frustrated in that job. I heard, but I always remember how decent she was and how. Seriously, she took this young journalist who was just trying to figure things out and just kept way over his head. That is really a great story on so many, so many levels. Mm -hmm. um, she used to let all the young people who come through town camp out in her house. She it was always an open door policy. But I don't know if you know that um, we got the Don Bowles car 
at the museum from the police impound lot where it had been for 37 years in Phoenix. And we trucked it on flatbed truck uh, to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and paid a <coughs> car researcher to bring it all the way back. It was a 1972 Datsun, and it's on display in the museum. Dish. You see, you can see Don Bowles was one of the few, thankfully, American journalists who's been murdered doing his job. But the floorboard, of course, it's this huge hole where the 11 sticks of dynamite went off. So it's and there. He fought for his oh. life for like 11 days. Yeah, he did. He did. So it's there as a memorial. Well, thank you, John. Students who are here <coughs> listening, I think that that is a great <coughs> example of a story is that sometimes you second guess yourself and say, oh, this person is too important or they won't have time for me or I'm just starting out. And you never know until you call. And it's always. Um, as a journalist, always surprise me at some of the people that you can just literally call up and they will answer or you can get to them very quickly. And, um, it, you know, I have a little saying is that, you know, sometimes somebody, you're doing a story on somebody with their chrysanthemum collection and they ask, they act like it's, you know, state secrets and they won't tell you and <laughs> stop the record and all this. And someone that you think, you know, shouldn't tell you anything will just spill things about everything in their life. So I just think it's, you never assume. And I, um, you know, the worst they can say is no or not call you bad. She had a daughter. She had a daughter. Am I correct? No, no, no. no. Okay. no. She no. never married. Okay. Um, I thought they yes. asked. I'm curious about the Austin premiere. When the play went there, you must have been nervous because that's your home place. How did it yeah. go? It was great. Uh, they We used a <coughs> Texas actress from there, and I think that helped. Oh, she was it? A, a woman named Barbara Chisholm, and it did so well that the full run happened. They extended it two weeks, and they finally had to shut it down because they had another show coming in. <laughs> but they brought it back for four more months. Um, with, Barbara, with Barbara again. So it's run for a really long time. It just closed in November. It started, I think, in February. But it was so great to have this um, another actress do it because we thought, oh, well, no, it's so great, and she is. But Barbara was really great, too, and, of course, her Texas accent was right on, and she actually looked a great deal like Molly did when she had the dimples. And um, So okay. it was, and it's interesting, both... Um, Barbara and Kathleen really, really believe in the material. It's it's close to their heart because it's it's their politics as well. So, not to get too mushy about it, but they they feel that they're doing some sort of public service by mm. by um, as some as other people have said, there's not that many places where progressives can get together and not be ashamed for to listen to liberal. Um, uh, liberal philosophy and, and, and liberal thought. And, and so if it does that, I think it's, a, it's worthwhile. Sure. I'm interested in the two different performances of Molly, like Kathleen Turner and Barbara Chisholm. When the public has such a strong memory of Molly herself, mm -hmm. what's it like for an actress to try to put her own stamp on the role? Well, I think they uh, <coughs> try to give their own stamp to it and not try to be Molly recreated um, because they can't. Although both of them look very much like her, I think, but neither of them are six feet tall. Uh, but they they dress the way Molly would have. And uh, Kathleen dyed her hair once. This production, she's wearing a wig. Uh, Barbara dyed her hair red. So uh, they were they were committed. <laughs> uh, and I think that they both succeeded. Simply because they're they're you know they're playing the character, and I I don't think anyone is fooled. But in Austin, uh, lots of stomping, shouting, crying, laughing. I mean, people really really got emotional. A lot of people who worked with her in Austin obviously showed up, and a lot of people who worked in the legislature where she spent a lot of her time showed up. And you know, none of them felt that there was any violence done to their memory of her. So that's. I think that's a win. But but it's tough for the actress because there's a few times where we, sh we do a rear projection where it's an actual picture of Molly, the real Molly. So if you're standing in front of that, uh, mm -hmm. you better you better look and be able to pull that off if you're saying, here I am a little bit younger and, and it's not you. <laughs> so they, they were 
both of them expressed a little um, you know, trepidation about that. Um, so. yeah. Probably everybody knows that. <coughs> you write something, then it becomes a production. So you know what the lighting and the this mm -hmm. and that. So is there some point that is there? Creative control take place, or well, you kind of defer to somebody else's knowledge of staging. And absolutely. Yes, that that was that was a really <coughs> interesting point. How collaborative the dramatic um, effort is. That we thought we came in with a good script, but where it ended up was so much better because of the work of all these people. I mean, we didn't even conceive of the fact that sound and music would add so much to it. But we have some guitars coming through it. Which doesn't sound like so much, but it really brings it into a new level, and so does the lighting, mm -hmm. and of course the set design. We had no idea what what the set design was going to be whatsoever, and to see all these amazingly creative people, most of about them about our age, who have been in the business for a really long time, bring all these skills and talents to bear, mm -hmm. it just moved it up into a whole different stratosphere, and that was so exciting to see because. You know, we've been working with words on paper, and then to see this whole army of people come in and you know plump it up and gussy it up and resurrect it into new ways, made me think, wow, that's, that's <coughs> the real excitement for us in understanding the theater world. And they're so fast. I mean, the the sound people and the lighting people, uh, you can you can tinker endlessly and change things, but they do their lighting plots and they they read the script and they actually really enjoy being part of this because. As I said, we were all in the rehearsal room together, and it was like it was do or die. We have to get this up really quickly, um, and so they don't often get to do that—to be in the rehearsal room and say. And we would take ideas from anyone. <laughs> you know, some of they would say, "Well, I think you could do this," or "What if you did this?" And so the the sound guy particularly got to um, compose some of the music and think of songs that we open and end and close with and. There's little snippets of songs throughout the play, and that was re really fun for them because they got to um, sort of brand it. What we didn't know coming into this the first time, we thought that for every performance, the director sits in the front row and yeah. listens to the performance. <laughs> no, it's so hard to be an actor because I, after opening night, everybody leaves. Oh. The playwright leaves, the director leaves, all set the sound, design. set designer, customer, everyone's gone. And you're there with the stage manager for six weeks. So it is a really lonely profession to be an actor, but it's also uh, a very gypsy life for everyone else I just mentioned, because they go from show to show. They're maybe only there for three days, and they have their contributions used, and then they depart. Um, Especially if it's a second production. Like they, they were in Philadelphia for longer, but then the... the um, was it? Yeah, the set designer, John, came down to Austin, but just a short time because it was really just getting it back up on its feet again. So really, he's there for three days, and then he's mm -hmm. on to his next show, and on to the next show. And that's why when you look at a playbill and you see all of these uh, productions that people have done, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, they must be 100 years old. <laughs> but they, a lot of it is just you know, one month tops. And then, but it was the biggest surprise that the director leaves because there's there's just no one there for the actors to, to bounce things off of. So obviously it was powerful that you guys are journalists. It's powerful because you could understand Molly and you know journalism and how to depict it and because you're wordsmiths and all that. But how much difference did it make and what kind of difference did it make? And how much could you use your journalism skills in writing a play? That's a really how different were they? That's a really good question. I think it helped to be a journalist in that we write quickly and we could revise quickly and we I'm getting the impression that some playwrights are just so enamored of every word. They've spent so much time on it, and they just you know, go to pieces if someone asks them to cut a line or change this. Or they haven't had quite as many editors as you have. <laughs> and so we're, we, we have no problem. We can do it on the fly. And I think journalism really helps you with that. And um, you Thanks. also realize there's six different ways to say something. So if someone doesn't like it, something, it, there's other alternatives and you can think of something else. But, but to be fair, the reason many playwrights feel that is that they, that's all they get is the sanctity of their words. 
They're, they're all underpaid. Very few can even make a living in this business. And so that becomes their turf, and they get really annoyed if people try to play with it. So, we and it's different than than screenwriters. You know, if you it just if you see any interview with actors, they say, "Oh, we improved a lot," and you can just hear think of the screenwriters, you know, sh <laughs> shrinking under the table. But for playwrights, the word once our play was published, I mean, we can't insist that every a than a but is said, and playwrights really have a lot more. Um, leverage than screenwriters, where people just you know trample all over their words and bring in somebody else and bring in eight script doctors and so I think that that's lucky that playwrights have insisted over the years that that it be performed. I I what, used to be the president of a community theater in Des Moines, and that was one of the problems is that as more and more work, plays were coming in with a lot of profanity and our rather older audience didn't like that, we, we could not change it. And even if, let's say, this play was way too long and we would just love to cut two songs out of this musical because you can't do it. You have, and so uh, Samuel French and Dramatist Play Service will even send out representatives, even in a small community theater, to make sure that it is being performed the way it is written. So um, if you wonder, like, oh, man, why don't they just cut that part out? <laughs> they can't. They can't. And that's why so many theaters do Shakespeare. No living playwright yeah. to worry about. <laughs> uh, you know, they, can, they, can, they can cut Shakespeare. Um, but the flexibility that journalism brought to the table, I think, helped us. I, we've since learned that at least two of those established playwrights who didn't succeed with the Molly Project, it was because they didn't want the agent to have any say over the script. And when they asked for that kind of uh, final script approval for us, we said, sure, we don't care. You know, we always have editors over our shoulders. We don't care who, you know. And, and he exerted absolutely no um, line by line or I don't like that word. It was just, you know, yay or nay. And luckily it was yay. So. Um, I think our ability to be flexible on that point helped us get the whole thing going. And coming from all that time in journalism, what, what was it, we was going back to my earlier question, what was it like when you first, you, you wrote the first line that was, you were making up, I mean, where you were? Well, the, the, I, I actually, I had taken, I had to the USC to, thinking I was going to get a master's here in Edinburgh. And then I heard about the Master of Professional Writing program um, in Dorsite. And I started thinking I would do nonfiction. And then they had such amazing teachers for screenwriting that I took the screenwriting program. And I, I truly believe that once you discover, oh, David's here, David was in like, once you discover final draft, you could put your laundry list on there, and it looks like a script. And I think that was very, um, that, you know, that, that was like this huge thing. Oh man, you know, you could you could write a script. And I think being in that program and getting assignments and doing them made me realize, yes, I, I could write a script. And so I really thank USC for really giving at least me the confidence to to do that. Well, as far as individual lines, I think we worried a lot more about rhythm and how it sounded. Mm -hmm. um, because that was a problem with some of Molly's words. They, they were terrific when you'd read them, but they were too long and there were too many clauses. And, and, and just there were tough words in there that it's hard for an actor to say. Mm -hmm. So that, you, you started looking at language in a totally different way. You know, what, what gave you punch and also um, not being so literal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have any qualms about putting words in somebody's mouth that they didn't say? No, because it was an actor, and we it, this was all sort of a, a an homage, and it it wasn't a lecture. As David said to us early on, there's people who are really interested in Molly Ivan's writings. They can go to the library or buy her books. Mm -hmm. This is a whole different project. Mm -hmm. So that here's a. Oh, I have a stupid question I want to ask. <laughs> if you make money off it, and you can tell us or not, does the more money come from the productions or from the sale of the scripts? You know, the, the productions. Uh -huh. the, um, you got we got a small amount when um, CMO French uh, decided to publish the book, but where the playwright gets his or her money is from the production itself. Now we will never get rich off this because we agreed to split it with 
um, but Ivan's a state. And we're happy about that because it goes to the Texas Observer and the ACLU. Mm -hmm. So if people support the play, they're really supporting Texas Observer and ACLU. But traditionally, playwrights get 6% of the box office receipts. And so that's where they get their money. So For the productions <laughs> they're actually associated with versus the ones who are just using the book at, at Open. Either one. Either, Either one. Either one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when people, when a theater buys it from Samuel French, they pay a certain licensing mm -hmm. fee of what we get a small percentage. But the actual real money comes from the tickets that are sold and that we get 6% that we now split with the estate, so we get 3%. But because we've and been... Then we split. <laughs> 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 There's a lot of splitting going on. Um, and because we've been so... It, this has been such a fun experience for us. We've been uh, taking ourselves to Austin, staying there a long time. So, you know, any money that we've made, we've probably spent in hotels and airfare. But it's still... Um, it's still we're happy to have done it. Mm -hmm. and, David Mamet famously said that he, David Mamet, could make a living as a playwright. It, uh, that has been the biggest eye-opener. It was the National Conference of Playwrights, first one that the Dramatists Guild held in June at George Mason University in Virginia that I went to. And these amazingly accomplished playwrights that have been writing for 20 and 30 years who have never had one production. Oh, and wow. it's just, they are the most exploited group of creative people I've, I've ever encountered. So, um, and then screenwriters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, we, so we know how lucky we are to on our first play to get it produced. Mm -hmm. I mean that that doesn't happen very often, and we're we're not blasé about that at all. I wondered if uh, this experience helped you negotiate with Irma Bombeck and the Damon Runyon people. I mean, did it give you more experience in how to deal with them, or well, was it the same thing, yay or nay? Well, they came to they us. came to us with both the came. Book. Yes. Oh. So that was the good thing, you know. Once you have a production up, then people hear about you, and so they came to us. Um, and yes, so that was a huge help. And others come to you, and we have said no. To. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, the, for the Bombeck family, I mean, we, they wanted to see the script and give approval, and we wouldn't want to do a, a play that they hated. That, you know, that would be, and you think of the long run and the marketing of it, you know, you do this play and the, and the family says, oh, we hate it. So it, it, we didn't have a problem saying, yes, we need to get the approval. It, just to reinforce or agree with what you're saying about the, the life of a playwright, my sister is a playwright in Brooklyn, and she's been writing plays for 30 years. She's probably had seven or eight production, I mean, plays in production all over the country um, in various venues. Uh, she runs the playwriting, uh, dramatic writing uh, department at SUNY Purchase, but she, it's constantly a struggle for her after all these years and all this experience. So. You know, even if you do have productions, it's even mm -hmm. even then, unless you just you you hit something, um, it's it's uh, yeah, it is a struggle. Yeah, it's it's quite unfair. It really is. I don't understand how how the the pie got really cut up that way. That playwrights are at the very bottom of the totem pole that they are. They used to get ten percent years ago, exactly. and somehow that's now shrunk to six percent. Everyone sort of elbowed them out of the way while they were. Uh, you know, typing over their keyboards. <laughs> what about other media? I would think this would be a perfect television special for HBO or Showtime. So do we! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so who knows? I think it would, especially in an election year. Mm -hmm. So it, it might happen through this, out, this uh, LA yeah, run. Yeah, yeah that's that, a good place. That they'll yeah, show that they'll show. Yeah. We, yeah. An HBO um, producer was there the other night. Oh. At, so we'll see. Uh, they, the theater people <coughs> obviously don't want anything on HBO before it's had its theatrical run. Right. So you know, the director, of course, would like it to go to, to New York and Washington before that's considered. There are uh, upcoming productions considered in, in the works now for uh, Berkeley and um, well, they're Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you hoping for New York and Washington? 
Well, Washington particularly, I think it really makes sense. And, and actually, Arena Stage wanted it uh, as a, again, just this last year. They've asked for it three times, and the scheduling hasn't worked out. So they wanted it this June for the Krieger Theater, and Kathleen had a conflict right in the middle of it. So Ka Kathleen's in this other play. I mean, to say how remarkable, show how remarkable she is, she's been in this other play called High, where she's on stage for two hours. It's not a one person, but she's on stage. She came here, it was like two and a half weeks ago, and then we had a break for Christmas a little, and a little, a few days off for New Year's, and so she had to relearn our entire play, and we had made a lot of changes in Austin and, and here, and she's been, it's been almost, a, it's been nine months, and so she had to re-memorize this all, and, and has done it, really, in about five days she was off the book. So that kind of ability to memorize and concentration is amazing. Yeah, especially because she's she's 56. I mean, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. <laughs> and that she can memorize 50 pages of dialogue. Yeah. And now she's going to, after she finishes this play, she's going back to high. So she'll have to do the other, you know, get back to that. <coughs> um, so that, it really lets you see a, a working theater actor's life is a tremendous amount of discipline and hard work and being there at the you know, right time every day and you know you, you can't show up half an hour late you've got to be there. there there are a lot of great actresses who have never done Broadway because they don't have the ability to do eight shows a week uh, so they could do a terrific one-time performance but they couldn't uh, be the sort of workhorse you have to be mm -hmm. to do a one-woman play, for example. It's really hard. Yeah. Well, we cannot thank you enough. You guys have been fabulous. Oh. Oh.